And my role today is to take the, the, the one slide summary of mouth guards in hockey that Jamie has provided earlier and tried to blow my lead with it and actually uh, move forward and give you a little bit of the reasoning as to what the role of mouth guards is in ice hockey, both in preventing injuries and uh, in reducing the risk of concussion. So, and we've got some video that hopefully is going to run. This is unfortunately the typical image of a hockey player. Um, and as, as Jamie pointed out as well, unfortunately the, the teeth and the jaws are all part of the head complex. And so injuries to the, to the face um, often manifest themselves as injuries to the head as well. My goals today are really simple. I want to talk to you about injury prevention, the types and designs of mouth guards, and how all of this ties into the area of concussion. Um, Dr. Tatter has talked about, you know, the role of sport in injuries. Sport causes between 10 and 39% of all orofacial injuries in children. And uh, as any of you who have gone through it will realize, the lifetime cost of an avulsed or lost tooth can easily reach $25,000 if that implant or bridge has to be replaced a couple times. So these preventable injuries are also extremely expensive. Um, one study showed, or one group of studies basically concludes that every athlete involved in contact sport has about a 10% chance per season of sustaining an orofacial injury, um, upwards of 50% chance at either of a facial or a dental injury in, in certain careers. Now, as, as Jamie and other uh, people this morning have said, you have to suck up to the local crowd on occasion, so I decided I needed to show a picture of that famous Montreal-based figure skater, George Laroc, who... Um, I've been lucky enough to be working with the Battle of the Blades this year, and George undoubtedly has had more injuries from figure skating for eight weeks than he had in most of his um, career. And those of you who have been watching Battle of the Blades have seen George get Annabelle Langlois skate in the side of his head. He was in with me to, to, for another injury that he, that he, that he suffered. So um, yeah, figure skating can be relatively dangerous as well. An athlete is 60% more likely to sustain damage to his teeth, his or her teeth, when not wearing a mouth guard. And, and mouth guards, aside from possibly the jock strap, are the, the single most effective piece of protective equipment that an athlete can wear. The National Youth Sport Foundation as a United States-based group estimates that upwards of 200,000 football dental injuries are prevented by the combination of mouth guards and face masks. So, Mouth guards are a very effective tool in injury prevention. This is from the 2002 uh, two Salt Lake Olympic Games. German athlete, very, very early in the tournament. Don't worry, you'll see it again. Um, and you'll see the results of this um, in a second. Um, here's the slow-mo version. You, it's great to, to stop pucks, but not with your face. Now, remember Dr. Tatter's imaging of you know, what causes a concussion and everything else, because it's going to, in the discussion of his injury, which, again, we will take a look at in a second, he had three pretty significant components to it. They schedule me before lunch for a reason, um, and this is it. Certainly, he had a significant dental component, and I would propose that most of that dental component, at least in the upper teeth, was a preventable injury if he had been wearing a mouth guard, which he wasn't. He had a pretty significant um, facial laceration, and he had, as you can, if you, I don't think I have a pointer here, but um, for those of you on the, on the English side, thank you, if you look right about here, there's a little step that indicates where his mandible is fractured. Okay, right there. Um, so, and, and it, despite all of those injuries, the reason that this athlete never again returned to play for Germany, either at a national level or at their club level, was because of post-concussive syndrome. And you know the, the jaw healed and the soft tissues healed and he had some dental implants, but from this particular injury, his brain never recovered enough for him to come back and play. Um, here's, I think, four years later, um, Torino 2006, another player who you've seen, a very innocent situation, a player who had played a thousand games without a mouth guard and without sustaining a dental injury. And Timu wound up when we saw him later that night looking somewhat like this. Um, and in fact, if you look closely at a couple of those teeth, the black marks are the tape from the stick that hit him. Um, just to prove that this is the actual injury. 
And when we'd removed all the pieces that uh, needed to be removed, this is what Timu wound up, wound up looking like. And again, I would propose to you this is an extremely preventable injury. Mouth guards, as Jamie talked about, come in various shapes and sizes, and I just want to give you an overview because we, like in concussions, have our own classification system. They were first introduced in the early 1900s. They were designed primarily to reduce severe dental and soft tissue injuries and some of the facial fractures that were going on. And really what they used to be was just a piece of vulcanized rubber that the, that the boxer held in place to try to reduce the, 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 the attenuate the blow to his head. Um, our classification system is type 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, the type 1 mouth guard is the stock mouth guard. You open the bag up, you put it in your mouth. There is no opportunity for you to modify it or change it or anything else like that. And, and really, they have virtually no place in, in sport at all. The type 2 is the one you know about, the boil and bite mouth guard. Um, they seem to have pretty um, common prevalence in hockey. They are a standard size for, you know, basically one size fits all. The problem with a boil and bite mouth guard is the bite part, and that most athletes, when they boil it up and you tell them to bite down, they bite down, and they bite right through the mouth guard. And as you can see, if you take one of those boil and bite mouth guards and hold it up to the light, in most cases, there's very little or no uh, mouth guard material left between the upper teeth and the lower teeth. So any kind of a blow that bangs the lower jaw and the upper jaw together um, is unfortunately going to um, have no protection, so you can easily fracture teeth. And if we're looking for some sort of absorptive component, uh, we're not going to get that. So again, type 1 and type 2 mouth guards really have no place, especially in ice hockey. Um, and this is, you can play this game with Sports Illustrated on your own, like going through and just looking at pictures of athletes who are competing and their mouth guard is not in place. And every one of these athletes basically has their mouth guard hanging out and if they didn't have a face mask in or have it tied to the, to the face mask, the mouth guard would fall out. And just like the one, the one finger rule with hockey helmets, if your mouth guard isn't in place when you need it, then it's a relatively useless piece of equipment. Um, there's a, there's a lot of commercial mouth guards out there, and I just want to um, point out a couple things. Just because you say the mouth guard prevents concussion doesn't mean that it does. There actually has to be some science behind it. The other thing I caution you about is on the bottom right, on the middle right hand of that, you see something about a $3,200 dental warranty. Okay, and you think, well, that's pretty good. If my kid gets a tooth knocked out, at least they can get, you know, some sort of, um, you know, dental treatment, and, you know, probably $3,200 would pay for an implant or a bridge. Now, when you go back in and look at the fine print on their contract, the contract says, yes, you are entitled to $3,200 of insurance, but it's maximum $100 per tooth. So to actually collect the $3,200 worth of insurance, you have to do $100 worth of damage to every one of your 32 teeth. So be very, very, very careful thinking that you're getting some sort of an incredible warranty and you don't need to have dental insurance when your kids are playing. Um, I also would point out that a lot of these warranties have exclusions that it that you know the they exclude injuries happening in hockey, either competition or practice, in lacrosse, in field hockey, which are the sports that we're putting these mouth guards in the kids for. So again, be very very careful about some of these warranties that you see associated with mouth guards. So we like the custom made mouth guards, the Type Three mouth guard that's made from a model of the athlete's teeth that provide an unbelievably good combination of uh, comfort, fit, ability to breathe, and the ability to speak. Um, my poor kids, um, because their daddy's a dentist, um, we've been wearing mouth guards on the hockey and soccer fields since they were five years old. And I can tell you on the hockey field, they're the only kids who can yell for a pass um, on the hockey arena because uh, everybody else has some sort of a stock mouth guard that's falling out when they try to you know, call to their line mate that they're open. So they, they do work. Um, the beautiful thing about custom-made mouth guards is that they're custom-made because, as we know, athletes come in George Laroque size and athletes come in Annabelle Langlois size, and it's nice to be able to have a mouth guard that fits both of them, um, and a custom-made mouth guard will do that. We really like the pressure laminated variety, which basically takes a series of, of layers of protective material um, and using a combination of heat and pressure, um, that material is adapted to the, to the plaster model of the athlete's teeth and it gives you, a, a, as I said, a really good combination of strength and, and, um, and protection and comfort. Now, if you're wearing a face mask, do you have to wear a mouth guard? 
And this, this injury, unfortunately, to this 14-year-old kid who was in month 23 of 24 months worth of orthodontics, um, just about ready to get his braces taken off, happened with him wearing a cage. Uh, cross check to the face, the cage collapsed, the, the little J strap that we were talking about earlier combined with the little pieces above collapsed and he suffered this injury uh, wearing a full face mask. Um, in, the, in the International Ice Hockey Federation, we have a rule that says um, all under 20 players wearing a half visor must wear a mouth guard, a properly fitted mouth guard, and we strongly suggest mouth guard use for all players wearing full face protection. And I, I think that's probably a lesson to be learned for everyone. Now, how does this all tie into the whole concussion thing? We had to have a picture of Eric Lindros somewhere today, because since everybody else pulled theirs out of their presentation, I kept mine in. Um, but we've seen a lot of leagues who have instituted mouth guard rules in the last five to seven years. And, and you know, there's a belief that maybe they brought those rules in, not necessarily because of issues relating to um, concern about the athlete's teeth, but more that they were worried about the liability of concussions and that maybe we should have a mouth guard rule to show that we're concerned about concussions. So where did this all start? Way back in 1964, one of the uh, leading pioneers in sport dentistry, John Stenger, realized that some of the guys on the Notre Dame football team were having fewer burners and stingers and, and, and fewer headaches than that when they were wearing mouth guards. Another fella took a bunch of cadavers and smacked them with two by fours and basically um, found that there was a significant decrease in the pressure to the cranial area in the athletes who were wearing mouth guards. But again, this is a dried skull and it, you know, whether or not this is more of, a, of, a, of a, a hard tissue injury versus soft tissue injury and whether or not that translates to the whole concussion area remains to be seen. Um, certainly in the early 90s, we started to believe that a mouth guard might act by absorbing some of the impact of a force and therefore maybe reducing the amount of acceleration to the brain. Um, so really, there were three theories proposed for how mouth guards may play a role um, in reducing the risk of concussion. The first one is this direct dissipation of um, force, where you know, effectively you just take a hit and if there's no mouth guard there, um, that force is directly uh, transmitted to your head. But if you put a mouth guard in and the mouth guard has some absorptive properties and it fully covers all the teeth, that mouth guard material might absorb some of the shock. So that would potentially come into play with an injury like this. I think we can, there we go. This is uh, University Football, Ottawa Carleton, um, annual Panda game. There is a rule in Canadian football that says you have to give five yards. Apparently, it was ignored in this particular play. Um, and this athlete, again, as you'll see, suffered a direct blow to the chin. I am not even remotely suggesting that a mouth guard would have prevented um, the neurotrauma that this athlete suffered. He, in addition to a lot of dental and jaw injuries, he, he also never returned to play football again because of post-concussive um, issues. But again, that's the type of force that again, maybe some sort of um, protective equipment with an absorptive component to it might have helped to absorb that shock a little bit. Now the second theory that a lot of people have out there is that the space between the jaw joint and the, and the, um, and the skull um, can be opened up when you put a mouth guard in. As you can see by those images, the space increases when the mouth guard's in place. And as a result, when you take a blow to the lower jaw, it's less likely to smack into the upper jaw. And again, that would more than likely happen in a, in a basket. Sorry, it's not all hockey today. It's a little basketball injury. But you'll see this one from a better angle. But this is a direct blow to the chin point, which is certainly, if nothing else, driving the head of the condyles up into the condylar fossa. And you'll see it, again, pretty, pretty clearly that way. And I think by anyone's definition of concussion this morning, this athlete is concussed. Um, maybe you can see it in his reaction right about here. Um, and you'll see it once more just because we might as well get it from all angles. You know, the problem is that in all of the models of concussion, um, you know, jaw joint hitting condylar head isn't really the one that we're looking for. What we're looking at primarily is what Dr. Tatter showed us in his, in his um, um, animation, which is this, the, the brain rolling around inside the skull. Um, so really that's what we want to try to prevent. So the third theory of how mouth guards may work 
relates to stabilizing the skull, which we had talked about with bobbleheads and everything else already this morning, where what we would like to do, if possible, is either serve to strengthen the head and neck muscles by preseason conditioning, etc., or actually activate those head and neck muscles by having the, the athlete clench down on a mouth guard in place, and hopefully that would reduce the arc of rotation that the head goes through when the athlete suffers a blow. Um, so to attempt to prove this, since they have apparently significantly lower ethical standards in Japan than they do here, one of Jean-Luc Dion, my colleague in the back, and our colleagues in Japan, uh, convinced a few university students, I suspect there was alcohol involved, to um, wear one of these toques that measured force and, and direction, or measured um, uh, direction in the, for directional forces in the X, Y, and Z axis. He basically then took this machine out, which is like one of those tennis ball machines that we've all practiced with, but this one fires soccer balls. Um, he then had the athlete stand in front of this machine and directed about 20 soccer balls at his head and measured the amount of force and rotation that happened. He then had the athlete bite down on a mouth guard and did, did the same thing again. He then asked the athlete if there were a few of his buddies at the frat house who would like to come over and in return for a case of beer or a case of sake, whatever they were giving out at the time, would do the same thing. But the net result of it was that biting down on the guard and activating your head and neck muscles significantly reduced the rotational forces that the head, the rotation that the head went through um, in the direction that the ball was coming from. And again, Dr. Karen Johnson has kind of in a different way said that the force required to concuss a fixed head is almost twice that of a moving head. So, you know, if we can eliminate the bobble head, maybe we can reduce the arc of rotation the head goes through and maybe the amount of trauma that the brain suffers may be reduced. Um, it, it's possible that the victim needs to know that the, that the blow is coming, but it's possible that just having the mouth guard in there acts as an irritant to those head and neck muscles, which causes them to fire a little bit more. And maybe even that irritation would, would allow you to reduce the severity of a blow um, if you didn't see it coming. And that would be one of these ones, which I'm, you've seen a million times. He doesn't necessarily see it coming. And, um, you know, I don't know that the rotation that his head went through may have been reduced, but they, you don't always, the bullet that gets you isn't the bullet that you hear or see, right? So, so where does that leave us? A couple other things that I want to go through with you before we're done. I, I am compelled to point out that there has been a lot of press in the last 12 to 18 months about performance enhancing mouth guards. There are athletes in a, in a lot of sports who are paying upwards of $2,500 or $3,000 to buy these performance enhancing mouth guards. Um, there is absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever that they do anything good aside from making the athlete $2,500 or $3,000 poorer. So I cannot uh, recommend these to any athletes at all. Um, Little bit of science that we have. Uh, a couple guys did propose that there was a protective role that mouth guards may play in reducing concussion in the early uh, 2000s. A couple studies from USA Football showed that maybe there was a little bit of unscientific evidence that mouth guards might reduce, might reduce concussions in, uh, in American football. The study that was talked about earlier today with face masks and that, where the group of athletes that had um, full face masks seem to have less severe concussions and come back quicker. Also, those athletes who had mouth guards in seem to have less severe concussions and come back and return to play more quickly. Um, that it would, and the, the conclusion from that was it would appear that concussion severity in ice hockey can be significantly reduced by wearing a full face shield, possibly with a mouth guard. Um, there's, but there's a couple studies that basically show no significant difference in mouth guard or not mouth guard users in basketball. Similarly in football, um, Paul McCrory did a very, very intensive uh, lit search and basically came up with the following conclusion. While there is no necessary proof that mouth guards prevent or have a role in preventing or reducing the risk of concussion in, uh, in sport, there's also no proof that they don't. Absence of proof is not proof of absence and more research and study is needed. And even at the recent Mayo Clinic a couple of weeks ago, I think that the, they, they will come up with a uh, proposal that says a communication strategy that will educate the hockey community on the role of equipment, helmets, mouth guards, and the rink environment is necessary to reduce concussions. Um, 
So again, in summary, I would remind you that the primary role of a mouth guard is to protect the teeth and the oral structures, that a mouth guard that's in place at the time of impact will be the only type of mouth guard that works. And again, comparing my previous slides where the mouth guard was out of place to these ones, you can see that these athletes falling down and everything else still have their mouth guard in place so that when they suffer a trauma, they will benefit uh, from the role of the mouth guard. Um, if we're gonna put a mouth guard in, we would like it to have properly balanced occlusion so that the force is dissipated over as many teeth as possible. There are materials that may offer increased shock absorption. Um, there's research, obviously, that needs to go on. There's some of it that's going on just outside Ottawa with the NFL uh, at, a, at a lab called Biomechanics. And I would leave you with this little known fact. The first testicular guard or cup was used in hockey in 1874, and the first helmet was used in 1974. It took 100 years for men to realize that the brain is also important. Thank you very much for your attention.